Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today with my April wrap up. I read a lot of books in April. I kept telling y'all that my April TBR was madness. And I was not kidding or exaggerating. I mean, you saw my TBR and you knew that there was books in addition to that that I was scheduled or set to be reading. So as is now public, the TBR or the, the wrap up of the booktuber chooses my TBR where Bethany sent me books to read and I sent Bethany books to read and we vlogged it. So that's already on my channel. So like the four books on here that are from that, I'm not going to talk about too much because like I have a whole lengthy video where I went quite in depth about what I thought about each of them. So I don't want to like waste your time. So I mean, you know, I'll, I'll mention them. They're in this stack, but I won't be spending too much time on that. Anyway, how many did I read? One, two, I read 13 books. The last time I read 13 books in a month was uh, last October. I know because I had 26 Halloweenish books on my TBR and I read half of them. And I was very proud of it at the time. So the first book I read was Destiny's Captive by Beverly Jenkins, which I loathed and despised entirely. And like probably the majority of the runtime of that booktuber chooses my TBR vlog is devoted to this book. <laughs> it's like the first half of it is just this. Um, so. Needless to say, I don't recommend. <laughs> this just in a nutshell, my response to this book is yikes. <laughs> the next book that I read was The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner. I read this because as previously stated, my plan for the month, no, my plan for the year to keep up with my book of the month club books is to read the previous month's book of the month in the subsequent month. This was my March book of the month. So I read it in April. I am on track with this plan. I was very concerned about this book letting me down because I think this cover is real pretty. And um, I have recently begun to identify with apothecaries ever since Alan declared that I look like I live in an apothecary. Or not that I look like, maybe he thinks I look like I would live in one regardless of my living situation. But where I live, he thinks looks like an apothecary. It just, it spoke to me on that level, despite the purpliness of this cover. <laughs> I liked it. I really did. Um, I was, I was hearing mixed things when I put it on my TBR. People were like, oh, it's so good. I can't wait for you to read it. And other people were like, ooh, good luck with that one. And I was like, uh-oh. Because when things are polarizing, I'm already tough to please. <laughs> Even the most popular books of the year are books that I often hate. So I was like, ooh, I quite liked this. I, I did not think it was groundbreaking. I would not say it's a favorite of the year, but I really liked this. And I don't really know, I haven't bothered to investigate. I don't really know what problems anybody would be having with this. Like, it's, it very much was kind of what I would have expected it to be. People had me worried. They're like, oh yeah, I was excited about that, but it, was, it let me down. I'm like, what were you expecting? <laughs> this book is exactly what it purports to be. So if you don't know anything about it, it kind of takes, uh, it's like a dual timeline, uh, present day and in the past. And they kind of like are connected because of an apothecary. So in the present day, there's a woman visiting London and um, she kind of stumbles upon this like what was this apothecary at one time but it's kind of like it's this like back alley and it's been forgotten and like i mean there's like more to like how she stumbles upon that but that's basically like the her like how she's involved with this or how she's connected to this because she stumbles upon what was once this apothecary and she has her own kind of personal life issues going on that in like not exactly not precisely but in their own ways mirror the events of the past and in the past then we we're following like this lady who owned this apothecary as well as this young girl who sort of like came to uh came to the apothecary and ended up kind of working with and for the apothecary and this apothecary is one that like while it did sell regular stuff that one would just generally need it kind of specialized in kind of like not off the books because it did keep its own record of this as well separately this secret underground trade of like poisons and like women's remedies um, basically like for women who are in trouble somehow that they could come here and like if they you know the law didn't really protect women back in the day so like if a woman was being abused or something and like there is no recourse uh, via the law uh, to get out of this um, this apothecary would sell her a poison to kill her husband. <laughs> so yeah, um, I thought the intermingling of the plot lines was cool. The way they kind of mirrored and paralleled each other, but you know, it wasn't this like on the nose where it's like exactly history repeating itself. It wasn't, but it was interesting like the kind of ways it's connected and in the ways in which it kind of comments on women's, kind of like the place of women and women's rights as it was and as it is now and the ways in which 
women can sometimes still be second class citizens in the present day, but it, the book isn't being just like angrily screaming at the reader that women should be treated better by the modern society. It's not doing that. Like it's not like aggressively soapboxing or anything, but it's kind of like pointing out ways in which society's biases and the role of women in society that like is presumed by society and this presumption is kind of projected onto women, how that can affect women even to the present day. So I, I thought it was interesting. I thought it was fascinating. I, I was quite invested in all of the women characters that, you know, both in the past and the present. It's not very long. It kind of like, it tells its story. It's this little like slice, like we're not doing the life story of the woman in the present day. We're not doing the life story of the owner of the apothecary. It's just this like little kind of slice of their lives that kind of is this paralleling chunk of it. So I think it handled what it was trying to do very well. And it was interesting, compelling, cool, atmospheric, and short. <laughs> it it was fine. Like, this is what I wanted out of it. It was exactly what I thought I'd get out of it. So I would recommend it. I don't think it's like the best book ever, but like, it's quite good. And it's, ex it's ex exactly what the, what the book jacket says that it is. So <laughs> like, that was great. Next book was a reread, and that was Stone of Tears by Terry Goodkind. I love the Sword of Truth books. Um, I recently did a podcast with Bethany um, over on the Chapter 3 podcast. Um, I'll leave that link down below because she and I both love the Sword of Truth books. Um, we kind of read them pre-booktube, pre-bookstagram, pre our online bookish life, and we've kind of been like revisiting them together because we're <laughs> like there's not a lot of love for Sword of Truth. There's there's not a lot of like for Sword of Truth. There's a lot of derision for Sword of Truth. So she and I kind of like bonded over like we like these books though. I'm like, are they the best thing ever? No. Are they perfect? God no. Was Terry Goodkind like oh. <laughs> Yes, but they're pretty good. <laughs> like we had a lot of fun reading them back when we read them and like now rereading them. We were like, oh, like, were we just young and we like didn't know what good books were? But like rereading them, she and I were both like, they're still really good. Like they're a lot of fun to read. And like, they're, they're good. <laughs> Best ever? No. Have problems? Yes. But they're just a ton of fun to read. And she and I maintain that we like them and recommend them. Um, so I had a ball reading Stone of Tears. Um, genuinely, sincerely, very possibly my highest like reading enjoyment level this month was Stone of Tears, just because it was fun. Nostalgic, escapist, fun. And like, I talked about this a lot in the podcast. Maybe I, where did I? Maybe I thought about it a lot. I don't know. But like, there's very few fantasy series, like since, this was like kind of my first. There's very few that I've read since then that have delivered the like pure, whole mind and body escapism that the Sword of Truth books delivers. Where like, I, for the duration of this read, am transported to a different world. There's a lot of great books that have a lot of great world building, fascinating characters that I love a lot and that I think are better written. Like, do I think Robin Hobb is a better writer? Do I think uh, Patrick Rothfuss is a better writer? Do I think uh, Joe Abercrombie is a better writer? Yes, I do. 100%. No question about it. But none of them really transport me to like this like fantasy adventure that I'm just like living. <laughs> The way Terry Goodkind's books do. And again, they're they're not the best written, I will not say that, but I am transported to a fun fantasy adventure that I feel like I'm like living with these characters and going on this, this quest. And like, it's exaggerated, it's ridiculous, but it's fun. It's so fun. So I had a ball rereading Son of Tears and like I maintain that like if you've just heard that Terry Goodkind was like a freaking weirdo, he was. <laughs> I'm sorry Terry, you know you were. But you know, get them from your library. You don't want to spend the money. They're, they're fun. Next was another reread and that was Ruin and Rising by Lee Bardugo. This wasn't such a fun reread. Um, and if you want to see the live show on Jesse's channel, because me, Jesse, and Joshana concluded our like reread of the Grisha books in anticipation of the Shadow and Bone show dropping. Um, so, you know, the live show for Ruin and Rising is on Jesse's channel. I will also leave like, that linked down below. And like mild spoilers, like this is a YA adventure romance fantasy. So I don't think this is very spoilery, but like I'll put a little something to indicate that spoilers are occurring and when they stop. But basically, like, the first time that I read this, I was so panicked about, like, the fact that I thought that Mal wouldn't be endgame. And so then, like, I was so relieved when I finished Ruin and Rising that Mal was endgame and that she did end up with Mal and he was, like, the, the ship <laughs> that, like, I gave it five stars because I was just like, oh, they are together. Oh, 
So this go around, like I was actually like paying attention to everything else because I wasn't worried about it. I wasn't sitting there going, this is probably the last time they'll talk or this is basically goodbye or like that's the closest they'll come to being together or this is heartbreaking. Like I wasn't stressed about that. I was just like, yeah, I know they'll be together. Okay, so like, let's do this adventure. And I was actually paying attention more to the adventure <laughs> and to like the magic and the actual story. And I was like, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like none of this makes like any sense. <laughs> So, uh, I still had fun. The characters are fun. The world is fun. I like it. I have a good time with it. But <laughs> it is no Six of Crows. Oh, next up is Fireborn uh, by Rosaria Munda. Oh, fuck, fuck. Ow. Oh my god. What the fuck? I enjoyed this. I heard a lot. I think it was overhyped for me, to be honest. Then again, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I did go into it. I think I maintained tempered expectations because even though it was so hyped, I was just like, mm, is it though? I also don't like the new covers. So I'm just like, I would like almost prefer not to be into this because like, if I'm really into this, then I'll be even angrier about the fact that I won't have a matching set with this style of cover. And I did like this, so I am upset about that. But I'm not like, this isn't like my new favorite series of all time. So like, this isn't like if Six of Crows had a cover change in the middle and I'd be like, what the fuck? <laughs> this is more just like, I, I do prefer this style of cover in, in my perfect world. Because I would like to read Flamefall, which is the second one. I would prefer the cover of Flamefall to be in keeping with this style. But no one asked me. So, Fireborn is a YA fantasy that like, I think was like, it was underhyped to me a lot when it came out, which is why I didn't really like prioritize it when it came out. And then it was overhyped in the interim. So I approached it with like, with like, we like leveled out at neutrality because it was like way underhyped and then it was overhyped. And I was like, these like average out to, to neutral. <laughs> so I went in neutral. And um, it is, I think, I think it's good. I definitely think it's good. And I think it's definitely better than like a lot of YA that I've read recently that's like come out more recently. Cause like I mentioned before that Perhaps this is merely my impression. Like, I don't have data to back this up, but I feel like there's just like so much YA that's just being churned out by publishers that there is very little attention being paid to actual quality. And again, like, that's a feel fact. <laughs> I have no data to support this beyond my own anecdotal experience, but that's how I've been feeling when I've picked up new YA and I'm just like, ugh, this sucks. This is just like everything else. They just put a new cover on basically the same old story and the other, the time they did it was better. That's how I've been feeling. So this reminded me more of like older YA that was back from when I still liked it. Like back in the day when we had Ember in the Ashes and Six of Crows and Strange the Dreamer and these were the YA big hits. This was more in keeping with that era of like, era which was like four years ago. Uh, it is, I think the latter half is much better than the first half. The first half is insanely info dumpy. It's a lot of telling and not showing, a lot, a lot of that. And I feel like there are more subtle and organic ways to introduce us to this world. It's doing a lot of catching you up to the political situation, catching you up to who everyone is, how this political system is supposed to work, who the sides are, how they all feel about those sides, what the dragons are, how they work. And like, there's a lot of interesting information there. Like, I like the setup and I think it's an interesting, a interesting setup to have to be telling the story in and to be, it introduces some interesting themes to play with it and I would actually see in YA very much. I just feel like it was delivered to the audience, to the reader in a very like info dumpy way. So I just, I felt kind of annoyed and exhausted by the beginning of it where I was just like, okay, like, please stop lecturing me. Like, please stop encyclopedia spewing at me about the world. And I would just like to kind of like learn it as I go. But I just generally prefer to learn as I go. A lot of books and photo and I always hate it. The latter half really now like you got the payoff. So like, all this setup for like this political situation um, is actually like paying off in some very interesting character dynamics and some very fascinating kind of uh, conflicting priorities and like gray morality etc etc. So I ended up quite enjoying it and I thought a lot of those themes were handled in a very much more subtle and nuanced way towards the end where the beginning was again a lot of telling and not showing and I was like whatever but it like it got good <laughs> so I feel mixed about it because like by the end I think like if I was rating them separately like if not that I think they I don't think this should be split into two books I'm not arguing that like all oh, this this should have been two books I don't think that but if I was like you know rating the first half separately from the second half it would be like three and five and so I ended up giving it a four because like 
I think that that's fair, <laughs> right? Because uh, the ending is like five star quality. The beginning is like a three at best. So I would say if you are picking this up, if you're interested in the world that it's set up, if you're interested in the types of themes that are necessarily introduced by the setup that's being info dumped at you, that you know, there is payoff for that. Like she ends up doing cool stuff with that. It just, it takes a while to get there. <laughs> For this to be a truly excellent book, like I would have preferred my introduction to this world to be just as good. But overall, I think it was a good book and I recommend it and I would like to read Flamefall. Next up was The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms by N.K. Jemisin. This was the patron buddy read for April and I had a ball reading this. Um, I love, 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 love the Broken Arts trilogy and it was actually really interesting for me going now back to reading the first book that she wrote because I believe this is her debut. And it was interesting seeing kind of like um, like the prototype version of like a lot of themes that she actually ends up exploring in Broken Earth. So it was kind of like seeing the like, like the drawing board version or like baby Jemison kind of like nudging those concepts and being like, this is a thing that I kind of want to be doing. And then she like full on does it in Broken Earth. So 100,000 Kingdoms was like, I might maybe enjoyed it more because I was going the reverse order. If I'd read this first, it was my first ever exposure to Jemison. I still would have liked it, I think. She has a very distinct authorial voice, which is like impressive that that voice is so clear and so distinct in the, even the very first book that she wrote. You're like, you open it, you read the first like sentence and you're like, this is the Jemison book. Just straight up. But because like it wasn't just this story and these themes that I was like engaging with, I was also engaging with like the meta textual like Jemison catalog where I was like ah this is interesting to see you doing this like I in my mind till now this was unique to the Broken Earth trilogy and now it is unique to Jemison in my mind but it is something that she has now done more than once this isn't something that is only done in Broken Earth this is a thing you clearly are interested in and like to do and we're already trying these things out here so I don't know I recommend. I don't know which is the better way to experience it. I can only tell you how I've experienced it. But I think there was something to be said for reading Broken Earth first and then giving this a go because it's it's interesting to see. And actually, I mean, I have a similar recommendation for Six of Crows and Grisha Trilogy because I read Six of Crows first and I think it's truly excellent. And then went back and read the Grisha Trilogy. And if I had only ever read the Grisha Trilogy, like I wouldn't be all that impressed with Lee Bardugo as a writer. Like I still think the Grisha Trilogy is like a lot of fun, but it's like, it's fine. But because I, I read Six of Crows, then I just kind of like had a lot more love for the world and also knew that Lee Bardugo, it, like her ability to like tap into like char messy characters, like she really like leans into that later. So like reading the Grisha trilogy after you're like starting to see how she's kind of like going in the direction of be doing more introspection with characters, but is like kind of sidelining that to tell the adventure story. And she like, I must have realized <laughs> that like her strong suit is this like character introspection which she really leans into at Six of Crows. So in that case too I would possibly recommend reading it the reverse order. Anywho, who's he's back to <laughs> 100,000 Kingdoms. I really enjoyed this. I immediately went out and purchased the next two books in the series which are not so much, this isn't a series where like this is like one story that's broken into three parts. The other two books are like tangentially connected to the events of this book but it's not like a direct sequel in the traditional sense. But I am fascinated by these themes. I love Jemison's writing style. Like now having seen that this voice carries over again, it's not unique to Broken Earth. This is just kind of like Jemison's voice is a voice that I love and I am excited to read more Jemison. And I'm, I just chewed through this, absolutely loved it. Can't wait to read more. The next book I read was The Lord of the, no, it wasn't, this is my Kindle. Um, I read The uh, a Heart of Blood and Ashes by Mila Vane or The Blades and Bodice Rippers Book Club. And I hated it. I did like the heroine in it, which again, if you want to see my full or more thoughts, then go check out the live show that was on Bethany's channel, um, where we all four of us discussed uh, the book. I liked it, I think, least per usual. Uh, it was a barbarian romance, uh, emphasis on the barbarian. And uh, I think all of us agreed that we liked her a lot more than we liked him, even like the people in the camp of loving the book. It was too long. I think all four of us, agreed that we liked her better than him and that the book was too long. I would not recommend, but it is apparently quite popular in the romance space for people who like barbarian romances. Like people are like, this is the one. So like, I can't claim to understand it, but apparently people are loving this. So if it sounds appealing to you, maybe give it a go because people love it. I don't know why. 
Next is another reread, and that was Best of Cold by Joe Abercrombie. This uh, was my favorite Joe Abercrombie book until the new uh, trilogy started coming out. So a little hatred, dethroned, best of cold, and then trouble with peace, dethroned, a little hatred. This was my like nearly third time reading this. I have, I think, already posted my review. I was a little more on the ball with actually reviewing it like more quickly after having read it. So I think that's already up. Non-spoiler. I still enjoy this book. I still think it's fantastic. I still think it's great. Call Shivers is like one of my favorite character arcs in all of fiction, and a very large chunk of his character arc is is in this book it's not all of it but his character arc over the over the across the first law books like is a is a fantastic one and you really get a lot of the meat of his character arc in this book so i just i'm always here for that the main thing this book is missing is glockta <laughs> but every book is missing glockta so yeah i again i talked about this in my my review i'm i i'm almost wanting to say i'm disappointed with it but only because of the first law books that I have reread, this is the only one that I feel like is the exact same experience every time you read it. It isn't different. <laughs> the other first law books, like you've learned something along the way, or you've learned something by the end that completely like recontextualizes the previous events. So then upon reread, you are now like experiencing this story and these events through a completely different lens because your like your view of it is colored by what you now know. Best of Cold doesn't really have anything like that about it. It doesn't end in a way where you're like, oh, oh. Um, so rereading it, it's just like a fantastic book. So it's a good book and it's good to read a good book, but it isn't a new experience rereading it. And like having loved like, how fun it is to have that new experience reading other first law books, it's kind of disappointing to not have that. But I guess like the first time you read it, like you'd know I, I should have expected that. <laughs> Because like, yeah, there isn't really anything about the ending that reframe is the beginning. So it's a great time. It's well written. I love these characters, love being in this world. I enjoy it. But it's not, it doesn't have kind of like those layers of experience that the other books have. So I guess that's a weakness in a way. It's not an immense weakness, but I don't know. <laughs> that was my main takeaway. Next up, I read Rain and Ruin. This was another book that Bethany picked for me, and I ended up really, really liking this one. Um, in terms of just reading enjoyment, out of the four books she sent me, this was the one I probably enjoyed the most, had the most fun reading. This is a fantasy romance. It is mm, mm, like 50-50. I would say like, or 60-40 maybe? I don't know. It is a strong fantasy story with a lot of politics and battle and a magic system and like all this kind of thing. But it, it, it's kind of almost like the style of YA fantasy, because YA fantasy tends to like put in a lot more of a romance plot than most like adult fantasy does. So this is in that, in keeping with that kind of style, but it's for adults. So it's not YA, it is definitely adult, but it's like YA and the like emphasis on romance. And then it does have like adult content um, related to the romance. But I think I really enjoyed it for that reason because it feels like the best of like old school YA where it just feels like a great fantasy story, but with this like strong romantic current. And then we've like aged it up because like these aren't 16 year olds, like they're adults making adult decisions um, about their love life. And I had a really good time. It's a Middle Eastern inspired world, which is really like kind of lush. And the, the author is like, her prose is very evocative. So it was, it was a good time. And I really liked the main characters and I would definitely read more from this author. I enjoyed this. Another Bethany book, uh, Fledgling by Octavia Butler. I had, uh, I own Parable of the Sower and had thought and intended that to be my first Octavia Butler, but I haven't read it yet and Bethany sent me Fledgling. So Fledgling ended up being my first Octavia Butler. I overall also enjoyed this one. This was of the ones Bethany sent me, the one that I think is probably the most impressive, the best, like the best book. But I had some problems with like the way in which the book is structured that I thought were less quality than the, like the themes. <laughs> like the story itself, the themes present in it, what like the characters are doing, the like concept she's exploring, etc is fascinating and unique. But the, the structure of the book is very kind of like info dumpy and kind of rushed and, and things like that about it. So like, as like a reader, like the reading experience, like I thought it could have been done better. But like what the thing that is being explored here and like the themes that are introduced and the concepts that are being played with was fascinating and really cool and really interesting. So I definitely want to read more Octavia Butler. 
Again, I still want a repairable of the sewer. I own it. So like now it's next up unless somebody again like scoops it and gives me some other Octavia Butler that for some reason I have to read. Uh, so I intend that to be next. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely recommend this. Um, I had zero issue with this. I don't super, super duper get why anyone would have a mega issue with this, but I'm informed that people have an issue with this. So I'm like paying it forward with giving you the warning that people take issue with the fact that the main character in this, who is a like a vampiric other species, not a human person. It is not, and vampires in this world are not humans that are like turned. They're just a different species. It's not a human. She looks kind of like an adolescent. She looks like a kid, but she is not a kid because one, she's not even human. And two, she is older than she looks. So like on the inside, she is an, uh, an adult <laughs> making adult decisions. So people take issue with the fact that this childlike looking thing does very adult things. Again, I have zero issue with this because of like how it's framed. This isn't a kid do doing these things. It's not even a kid that was turned into a vampire doing these things. This is not even a human. So like, I don't care at all. But again, I understand that there are people that really are bothered by that. So FYI. Next is another Bethany book and that was American Hippo. These are kind of back to back because I was like coming up on the deadline to like be posting the video and I was like I gotta finish these. <laughs> I hated American Hippo very much. Uh, don't recommend this. This is actually a bind up of two novellas and two short stories. So four altogether um, that all take place in this world. It is an alternate history America where the American government, this is a real thing that was considered by the American government that is to import hippos and ranch them. Uh, obviously America chose not to go with the hippo plan. But in this book, America did decide to go with the hippo plan. But the, these stories don't really like explore that at all beyond just like, FYI, there's hippos. <laughs> like we're, we're pretending like that did happen, but we're not gonna like actually like go into that at all. So if that's, these books aren't about that. They just take place in a world where that happened, if that makes sense. And I would have much preferred a book that actually is about that <laughs> and the repercussions of that, which would have been immense. There would have been incredibly like there are far reaching repercussions for if the government had done that. The book isn't concerned with that. The book is a bunch of, like it's a whole bunch of characters that in my opinion are very surface level and aren't like, it. I didn't think this was fun. I didn't think it was interesting. <laughs> it was boring as hell. <laughs> so <laughs> would not recommend. The second to last book that I read was a buddy read with Mara from Books Like Woe and Alan from the Library of Alexandria. And that was the Jamaica Inn by Daphne du Maurier. I think I mentioned this in the TBR video, but like we kind of figured out that like, even though the three of us have like kind of wildly different tastes and interests, our like Venn diagram crosses over in this like neat little nugget of, of Daphne du Maurier. <laughs> so we buddy read Jamaica Inn and I think all three of us really liked it. And I think all three of us like Rebecca better. <laughs> so like, that's kind of how we figured out that all of us would be interested in Daphne du Maurier because we had all read Rebecca and liked it and were interested in reading more. But yeah, I I think, I mean, it's an incredibly atmospheric book. This seems to be like basically Daphne du Maurier's kind of thing <laughs> is atmosphere, um, setting a mood, setting a tone, really putting you in a place in time, really putting you in the headspace of characters that are in this place. Um, making the place almost a character unto, unto itself. The, the location here isn't quite the like character that Manderley is in Rebecca, but Jamaica Inn and like the this rural remote place where this book takes place is like a constant, like, like the fact of that is, it's more than a setting. The fact of that is is present throughout the story in a very active way. I thought it was an interesting exploration of some gray characters I likened it to Grimdark in that like the characters aren't, there is no like good guy. The people like, I guess you're rooting for them, but mainly you're just kind of following them. You're kind of just seeing what these people do in the situation. And the author isn't trying to be like, but it's fine because I explained it with this. Or like, you know, like I feel like in particular YA will do that. Or like the broody, angsty bad boy who seems like the bad boy, but then you find out his secret backstory motivations are that like he had to do this because he was forced to do it. And then you're like, oh, he's secretly a good, like the book doesn't try to do that. Like people are messy and they are a lot of them not good, <laughs> but it's just a fascinating kind of like slice of humanity in this rural part of England doing some questionable things. <laughs> so I think it's interesting. Uh, the ending is quite a, packs quite a punch. I'd been kind of spoiled for it because I've seen a, a few adaptations of this. None of those adaptations are actually as accurate 
um, as the Hitchcock Rebecca is to the book Rebecca. For that reason, like, I was somewhat spoiled for what would happen. But I will say that the way that it actually happens in the book, if you, like me, have seen, like, the miniseries that they did a couple years ago with Jessica Brown Finley, or if you've, I mean, if you've seen the Hitchcock one, it is nothing like the book. You are not spoiled for anything. <laughs> if you've seen some adaptations of this, the book is different. <laughs> the book just is kind of wild. So, like, if you're like, oh, I've already been spoiled for that, it won't be any fun to read it, you're wrong. The book may surprise you. <laughs> it did surprise me a bit in the end. Like, overall, like, the events of the plot, I was familiar with and knew what to expect. But there's some very key details about how this actually goes down that are unique to the book that I haven't, has not been present in an adaptation that I have seen. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I would, I would generally recommend this book. Um, and I would continue to recommend it even if you've seen an adaptation because this one, this one's, uh, it's interesting. <laughs> the last book that I read was, oh God, Northern Wrath by Tilde Cold Holt. Um, I started reading this in January um, and I finally actually read it. And I was disappointed with this. That's kind of why I didn't finish it because I was feeling like, ooh, I don't know if I'm liking this. And it was just breaking my heart because this is such a Viking book. And it's the first in a series, the Hanged God trilogy. And I was so pumped to have like a Viking series to be on board with. And I was like, by not continuing to read it, I didn't have to have past judgment on it. And I was just like, oh yeah, I'm reading that. Maybe it'll get better. But I was like pretty sure that it wouldn't. But if I don't read it, I don't know that. <laughs> So this wasn't a horrible, this is not my thing. I, I didn't like how it was executed. There are some things about it. I mean, like the Viking lore and the Viking-y things in it. Like, I love Viking stuff. And it was done in ways that I hadn't really seen before in other like Viking-ish books. But a lot of the way that this is told. Um, so I will say like, I do recommend this, but not if you're like me. But a lot, like the way, the, a lot of things about the writing style are reminiscent to me of things that I strongly dislike in like John Gwynn's books or Brandon Sanderson's books, two authors with immense popularity and success. So clearly most people do not have the issues that I have. So I have to think that this book may very well deserve your attention and reading of it because a lot of people love Malice. A lot of people love Brandon Sanderson. And so those same people very possibly, very likely would enjoy this. So if you're one of those people, if you love the Faithful and the Fallen series and you love uh, the Stormlight Archive, etc., this may be for you. It's, it's, it wasn't for me. I probably will not continue with the series. Although the end did pick up a bit and made me almost kind of want to read on, but like, no, no, not really though. <laughs> Which is kind of a letdown. Um, I don't think it's bad. I gave it three stars. Did I give it three stars? I think I gave it three stars. The Vikinginess of it, like I'm always here for that. And I did enjoy it more than Malice. I just found a lot of it to be quite childish and info dumpy. And I feel like I say childish and info dumpy a lot of times about John Gwynn's books and well, book, I only read Malice and Brandon Sanderson's books. And again, most people don't seem to have those issues. <laughs> it's just me. So it's, it, it might be great. <laughs> it wasn't for me. So yeah, those are all the books that I read in what month? April. Let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these books, if I've now inspired you to pick up any of these books, if uh, you loved them, if you hated them, if you agree or disagree with me. Um, our patron buddy read for May is going to be The Shadow of What Was Lost, which I mentioned in my PBR, um, but mentioning it again because I was just talking about my patron buddy read and like I had a lot of fun buddy reading with patrons. So if you want to get in on that, my Patreon is linked down below or down. It's up to you. Uh, I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays, so like and subscribe, and I'll see you when I see you.